All right, well, open your Bibles, uh, if you would, to, uh, you can start with John 16. And we're going to continue our series on studying the Bible. We talked just a little bit, I guess, about um, just the need for Bible study. I think we went through 2 Timothy 2.15. We talked about studying is important. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Uh, we're not trying to uh, study the Bible to show ourselves approved unto man. Now, that is a byproduct of our study, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Other people will notice your study. And uh, I mentioned to you uh, when we were meeting that uh, there really wasn't a class. And, 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 I, and I actually stand corrected. There actually was a class, and it was called Bible Study Methods. It was a one-credit class. It was very, very, very quick. But it wasn't exhaustive. You spend the rest of your life studying the Bible. It, study the Bible to know the Bible. Does that make sense? Study the Bible to know the Bible. But more importantly, study the Bible to know God. Okay, study the Bible to know God. Uh, you, you, may, you may not have the Bible. We might not have. Somebody might. I mean, what happens if, you're, if your Bible is lost? The other day I was driving down the road. And you, you know, you can tell a Bible when you see it. You can tell a Bible when you see it. So I'm, I'm driving down the road, and, and I'm driving. I look down past, and I thought, well, that was, a, that was a Bible. And just my good conscience, I just thought, I pulled over, and I, I said, I got to I gotta try to get this thing. You know, I just can't just leave it in the middle of the road. Things are going to get trashed. And, and so, so I pulled around, and, and uh, I got out. I ran across, you know, two, three lanes, and grabbed the Bible, another thing, and I brought it back to headquarters, and you guys might have seen it. It's just this little Bible. It's sitting on the back by the window, right? It was, all, it was, it was raining that day, and uh, we might not have the Word of God. So study to know the Bible, but study to know God. That's the importance of the method we're talking about tonight, which is the Bible study method, the Bible study method. Now, this is, by way of introduction, this is an area that every Christian can improve upon. There is no Christian that can say, well, I, I don't need to really grow in this area. I think I've, I've, I've learned all that there is with, uh, by way of learning how to learn. It's just we, we've never really arrived there. And, and uh, not many Christians actually study the Bible to begin with. Not many Christians actually study the Bible. They, they, might, they might read a passage. If I asked, uh, it's interesting, you see a lot of Gallup polls, and they, they ask questions like, how many of you read your Bible? And then how many of you study your Bible? The problem is, is that a lot of people equate the reading of the Bible with the study of the Bible. And tonight I'm here to tell you that there are two totally different things. You can read the Bible and not study the Bible. So there are a lot of Christians who, who will read through the Bible thinking that they're studying. Reading is part of the study, but it's not the study. So we can improve on how to study the Bible. So this method, the method we're covering tonight, is the devotional, uh, devotional method of Bible study. Now, many people, I think including those people who were raised in Christian homes, don't know what devotions really mean. They don't know what quiet time actually means. They think quiet time is like a, a punishment. Doesn't that sound like a punishment to you? I mean, I know if my parents said, it's time to have some quiet time. I would think I'm being grounded or being uh, quarantined, like in a room, and, uh, and, and, and you cannot play with your Legos. Quiet time does not have like a, 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 a positive feel to it, does it? So I think a lot of kids who grow up in Christian homes are told to have devotions. They're encouraged to have devotions. They're encouraged to have quiet time or time with the Lord. But they don't really understand what that means. So, the definition of devotion is simply this. Uh, it's, a, it's a time when a Christian will privately seek to engage God to learn and apply biblical truth. Okay? It's real simple. It's a time when a Christian will privately seek to engage God to learn and apply biblical truth. Now, we might say, well, we have family devotions, and that's not a private time. But this type of devotion that we're talking about tonight is kind of this private time. It's a time when, when we can get alone with God. It's about building a personal 
relationship. And this is about application. Bible study, the Bible study method, the, the, the devotional method of Bible study is all about application. So let's remember that. And there are four steps to this process. So I want you to write these four steps as we go through them. Number one, number one, praying. We must have praying. Every devotional time and our quiet time should start with prayer. You, you don't want to engage a devotional meeting with God without praying, asking God for guidance before you start the study. I don't know how many of you do that, but a lot of time we just pick up the Bible and we just start reading indiscriminately. We just read. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So we just say, well, this is good. This is good, Matthew 26, and I'm just going to start reading. And can I just say tonight that, that this is where we got to put the brakes on. This is where we have to put the brakes on. We need to begin to pray. We need to seek God in this. If you want this revelation, if you want illumination, it really starts with participation. You gotta, this is a joint effort between the Holy Spirit and you getting together and God revealing in his word things about himself, okay? It, it, if you want illumination, first participation. In John 16, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now that's neat. If you venture into a devotional method of Bible study without seeking God to help you understand it, you're missing the biggest component there, and that's God illuminating your mind. He's going to be the one that reveals the truth. And if he's absent, if he's absent from your prayer life, if you are not seeking God first in terms of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I need help. Reveal something to me in this passage. You're going to miss the bigger, and you're going to read it just for facts. You will read the Bible for academics, not application. That's what will happen. And a lot of Christians grow up in wonderful Christian homes with maybe even godly Christian parents who actually have devotions and have quiet times, but yet they have not imparted that to their child and they will read for academics. And, 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 I, and I, Dana knows I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull her out on the carpet here. And she said to me this, I, just, I, I think this is a great example. She said that she didn't even know how to do devotions. She read her Bible, but she didn't even know how to do her devotions until she went to college. I think it was to college, right? out of high school, somewhere in that area. She read her Bible. A lot, of pe a lot of kids read their Bible, but they don't know what they're looking for. And that's the problem. It's not a what, it's a who. It's not about what you're looking for. It's about who you're looking for within the context of who is in the Bible I'm looking to find. And of course, we know that to be the Lord, but you have to have this participation with you and God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 9 through 13. It says this, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. This is how he's done it. He's done this with his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 12, Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. This is how we get to know God. It's through the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The Holy Ghost is the one. The Spirit of God is the one that's going to teach us. And we think that we're just going to pick up the scriptures and just just learn accidentally. So we pray. We go into this thing and we pray. And here are three ways in which we pray. First of all, we pray with confidence. You have to begin your prayers with confidence. 1 John 5, 14, And this is the confidence that we have of Him, have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. We ask it according to His will. Did you know God wants you to study the Bible? <laughs> It's really easy then to pray in a, in a way that's confident. What You should be able to wake up in the morning and say, hey, Lord, 
Uh, you know what? I, I woke up this morning early for you, and I want to have quiet time with, with my Lord. And, and you have wanted me to study the Word of God. You want me to dive in to the Word of God this morning. It's early. The birds are chirping. It's still dark out in some cases, right? And we are here. We're going to meet together. And, and, and Lord, I am asking you that you would enable me through the Holy Spirit to learn something in the Bible this morning that will help me. And because, Lord, you said that you wanted me to study, I'm going to take it uh, uh, by face value. You're going to give me something this morning. I'm looking for you and your word this morning. Not looking for some something. I'm looking for someone. I'm looking for you to show me you and your word. And so you can pray with confidence. That's number, that's number one. Number two, you got to pray with confession. Pray with confession. Don't enter into your Bible study in the morning without confessing to God your sin. Lord, uh, I'm here this morning, and I'm here for you. You want me here. And, and, I, and I'm going to pray this morning that you show me your word. And inside you're thinking, man, I've got some sin in my life that needs to be get confessed to God. And you don't say anything? You don't think that's going to hinder the illumination of, of the Spirit in your life? The psalmist said in Psalm 51, 1 to 3, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. You ever sit down in your quiet time with the Lord and say, Lord, you know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know that you know I'm a sinner. And I've sinned and I've done wrong. And I want to get right this morning. Confession is, is really a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know what happens when you don't confess? There's this, um, there's this hesitation to, to really be yourself, isn't it? Like, you, like you're just kind of concerned, you know? There's, 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 there's no peace. But when you just get out there in front of it and you confess your sin and you say, hey, man, you know what, I, Lord, I've, I've done wrong, and I need to be right. And when you can confess your sin before God, listen, you're not trying to fake God. You're not trying to tell him something he doesn't know. He, he, he knows, and he knows you know. So just fess up and say, Lord, I'm not, I, I, I've sinned. And name your sin too. Don't, don't be so vague. I'm a sinner, Lord. All have sinned, you know. You know the verse. You wrote it. <laughs> you get out in front of it, and you say, no, Lord, this is where I've done wrong. I tell you what, your quiet time, your devotion time will be will be wonderful because you're not trying to pretend. You're not pretending like, like something didn't happen. You, you, you are just getting out in front. You're saying, Lord, I just need to be right. So pray with confidence, pray with confession, and pray with consecration. This just simply means to declare sacred or set apart. Uh, this is a very special time. Your devotional time is a very, very special time. The devotional, the devotional method of Bible study is a very important, is a very important time. This is where you're going to learn the most. This will, this will affect every other method we talk about. It'll affect how you, how, how you read and how you study your Bible going forward. But this time, especially when it comes to this time of prayer, you and God talking about your faults, right? Talking about your faults but praying with confidence. Never take this time lightly. Never take your, 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 your quiet time lightly. This should be really uh, one of the main, the main components to your day. If I was to ask you, and, and ask you honestly, how many of you would agree that your day is just better? It's just better when you have your quiet time. I, I, think, I think part of that, I think part of the reason is because your day doesn't seem rushed. I, I, I believe that's part of it. I, I do. I, I think when you get up and, you're, and, and you just barely get to, get to work on time and you just barely get the first task done and then you barely make it to your second meeting and third meeting, I mean, every little step of the way, you just can't get, you're just behind the, the proverbial eight ball. You just can't get there. But when you get up 
and you say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you time in the morning, and, and you do whatever you want to do with that time. And you, you wake up and you just start with praying, Lord, I believe, I believe this is what you have for me. You, you want me to be here. I want to be, you know, you can just be honest with the Lord. <laughs> Lord, you want me here. I don't really want to be here. I don't, I, I, I'm tired. I got four hours of sleep last night and, and I can't hardly keep my eyes open. And Lord, you will be lucky if I keep my eyes open long enough. But I'm praying right now that you help me. You help me. You start to confess. Lord, the reason why I only got four hours is I stayed up too late. I stayed up too late watching Netflix or, or, uh, or, or whatever, it is you, whatever it is you do, you know, uh, on Facebook, Candy Crush or whatever it is. And you know, Lord, I'm a sinner. And you know, I shouldn't have been playing Candy Crush. And, and you know what? I, I, I should have been sleeping. My parents told me to go to sleep and I didn't go to sleep. And so you, you confess and you say, Lord, this is a time, a sacred time. I want, I, I want you to work here in, in my presence right now. I want you to show me what you have for me. This is, the, this is the beginning of the devotional method of Bible study. This is the beginning of it. You start with prayer. You start with prayer. Okay, number one, there should be praying. Number two, there should be partaking. Okay, there should be partaking. First, you have to you need to select a, a, a verse or, or a passage to read and actually read it, okay? There, so there's, you have to, I mean, intentions are good, but they're not good enough. I remember years ago, my dad, I would, I would leave a light on, and uh, my dad said this to me all the time. I always say, when I left the light on, my dad would say, uh, you know he left the light on? I said, I'm sorry, Dad. You know why don't he, he said, He said, uh, sorry is not good enough. Don't let it happen again. I mean, intentions are good. I mean, I can say, Dad, I'll I'll, I'll try. But what he wants is, I mean, we can can select a a passage. We can select a, a verse with all the right intention, but not actually do it. And you know what? It's not good enough. We actually have to read it. You have to get the word of God in you, Matthew 4, 4. No, everybody knows this verse. Uh, but, he, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is how we live. This is how the Christian is supposed to live, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, hanging on every word, hanging on every word. Have you ever had a, uh, a good encounter with somebody that maybe you, maybe you really highly respect, and you're literally hanging on every single. Maybe it's a maybe, maybe it's a maybe it's a bad encounter. Maybe it's a rebuke, and uh, you're just waiting for every single word. And every single word that's said is a word that is impressioned that 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 that, um, that is impressionable, right? That that every single word. Is, is important. Every single thing they say, and even the way that it's said, is so critical to you. Like you think about it, and you, 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 you and we're going to get into this in a second. We're going to get in, into kind of the, the, the meditation, but, um, but we think about it, right? We're hanging on every word. This is how man shall live. This is how we look for, this is where we look for an enlightenment. We look for enlightenment in the word of God. Now, people look for enlightenment in all sorts of other ways, but the, the Bible says in Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy word giveth light. I mean, that's important. That's where we find it. It's God's word coming into us. The entrance of thy word giveth light. That's how we are enlightened. It goes on to say, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I tell you, we, um, we miss this, though. We miss the partaking of God's word in our life. First, we miss the prayer, and then we miss the partaking. And, and this isn't talking about just church either. I think church is important. There's an old-time preacher, and he says that you need three to thrive. You ever hear that? You ever hear three to thrive? It's talking about church services. You need three to thrive. It's good, but I think we can do better. I think three to thrive is important, but you really need seven to survive. You need seven days of constant 
words of God in your life. You, you need to have every day a time where you meet with God. And I, I'll tell you this, the more that you love God, the more you'll enjoy meeting with him. It, it might seem like a burden at first, but the more that you do it, the more that you hang on every word. The, the, more, the more it means to you, the more those encounters mean to you. We really need the word of God in our life. John 15, 3, now you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. This is how we live. This is how we get clean. This is how light comes into our life. So we need to partake the word of God. First, there needs to be praying. Secondly, there needs to be partaking. You probably can't guess number three, <laughs> but it, it does start with a P. There needs to be pondering. There needs to be some pondering. This is just simply meditating, but it didn't start with a, a P, so I had to change it. We need to ponder what the Word of God says. So we start out by, we start out by our praying. We get together with God in the morning, and we have, uh, we have this, little, this little time with Him, right? And uh, we, we start praying with, with confidence. Lord, this is your will for my life. Right now, in this very moment, you told me to study. I'm here. You want me to be here. And maybe I don't want to necessarily be here right now. So this is the confession part, right? So now you're confessing even. You're like, Lord, this is tough. It's 4.30, 5.30, 6.30, whatever. Uh, Lord, I, I don't understand the King James English. Lord, this is, this is a big chapter. Lord, I've got some sin in my life. I, I've, I've been listening to things I've been listening to. I've been, I've been talking to people I shouldn't have been talking to. These are the names. This is, this is the time you just open up to God. And then there's some consecration. You say, Lord, this is a holy time. I'm not going to take it for granted. This is me meeting with you. Let's do this thing. So there's the praying. Then there's the partaking. Now you're going to ponder now you start to ponder. Psalm 119.15, I will meditate in thy precepts. And precepts are, are mandates or, or simply just commands. This is uh, what has God said uh, for us to do? What has God mandated? I'm, I'm thinking, the psalmist said, I'm, I'm meditating, I'm pondering your laws, your precepts. In Psalm 143.5, I remember the days of old, I meditate on all thy works. So not only are you supposed to, you're supposed to meditate on what it is God told you to do, but it's also meditating on what you saw God do, right? This is, I'm meditating on the works of God. He says, I muse on the work of thy hands. And here the psalmist just simply uh, remembers and then begins to review or reflect on what it was that God has done. So it's, we, we, we don't just meditate on the laws, and we don't just meditate on the miracles. We say, I'm going to meditate on the laws, the commandments, the mandates. I want to meditate on, on all the works of your hand. And, and this is where you start to really just ponder. Think about it. Think about the things that God has told you to think about. You begin to meditate. Psalm 77, I will meditate also on thy works and talk of thy doings. And I love this last part. And I say that this is a really wonderful last part. And I will talk and talk of all thy doings. I think this is especially important because part of, I think, the pondering process internally is, is somehow being able to voice what it is God has done. I think that's part of the meditation process. I think meditation can happen, yes, internally, but I think it also happens reflectively as you begin to talk to other people. And you begin to think about what it is that God has not just said to do his mandates, but what also God has done. It's part of that pondering process to tell others what God has taught you. Now, if I was to ask you tonight, how many people, how many people learn uh, through experience? Most of you would raise your hand. I learn by doing. Most people learn by doing. Most, I would say most people. We learn by classroom level of instruction, but we also learn by doing. Part of the learning process, part of this pondering process is to learn to ponder by explaining what it is God has done. I think that's really critical. I think when you're able to tell other people what God has done, 
and what he has commanded, I think that you can internalize that. It just becomes a wonderful source of, of, uh, of meditation. You just, you think about that and you're able to tell other people. Usually when we tell other people, uh, when we instruct other people, we've really learned ourselves. You know, I, I find myself doing that. Like there's several different levels of, of learning for me. One is just learning for me. The other is learning to be able to tell other people what I've learned. That is the next level of learning. When you can begin to instruct other people, that is really critical. So that's part of this pondering process. It's, uh, it's, it's telling other people what God has done. Here's a couple of questions that we can ask ourselves. And this is the point. This is the point in our, in our devotional method of Bible study when we ask this question, what do I do with what I've learned? What do I do with what I've learned? I've learned all this stuff. Now what do I do with it? This is part of that uh, devotional method. What do I do with it? You can ask questions like this. What is the truth found in the scripture? What is the truth found in the scripture? Kind of excavating that truth out of there. It's, it's, it's not a, a quick read. It's, it's, a, it's slowing it down. What is the truth in this verse, in this passage? Number two, what in my life needs to change? This is a great question we can ask ourselves as we begin to ponder the Word of God. What needs to change in my life? As I read this text, what do I personally, what do I personally need to change? Number three, is there some sin I need to forsake? These are just simple questions we can ask. With What do I do with what I've learned? What truth is found? What my life needs to change? Is there some sin that I, that I need to forsake? How, can, how, how to take what I know and then apply it, right? We're talking about the devotional method of Bible study. How do we apply the Word of God in our life? If you're not applying it, it just becomes academics. We want to do more than just learn the, the, learn the, the, the truth. We want to apply that truth. And that brings me to my fourth point. Not only do we need to ponder, but we need to practice. We need to practice. This is the application part. This is where I think the rubber meets the road. Okay? Practice. James 1.21 Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving our own selves. We, listen, it's more than just receiving it. We know that's important. But we need to practice this. First you partake it, then you practice it. And it's dangerous to partake and not practice. It's dangerous. It, it, it's not, it's, it's uh, James 4.17 later on in the chapter, it says this, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. If you know what you should be doing and you don't do it, you're, you're in sin. You got to go back to the beginning and start confessing to God, Lord, I know some things about you and I've met you in the Bible in my study in the morning and I have not been the man that I ought to be, the woman I ought to be, the children I ought to be, the, the parents I ought to be. I'm not the person that I ought to be. I know these truths. I'm not applying them to my life, and that is sin. That's big, isn't it? If you know what you should do and you don't do it, that's sin. So then we ought to go back to the confession, right? So we have to, we have to practice this, and there is a great blessing for those people who hear and do. It's to hear and to do, and in Luke 6.47... Uh, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the streams beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. That's the person who hears and does. But he that heareth and doeth not, so the person who just hears, he's weak. He is like a man that without a foundation, built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. The person who hears 
and does is strong. The person who hears and does not do is weak. And we ask ourselves why there are so many weak Christians, you know? Why are there Christians out there that just consistently and continually flounder? They're just, there's no strength. There's, there, there is no joy in their life. I tell you, it's, it's, the, it's the people who hear the word of God and they're obedient to it. Those are the people, those are the people with strong foundations that cannot be shaken. This isn't a weak Christian. It's a strong one. We can ask ourselves questions like this. What are the examples I need to follow? What are the examples I need to follow? Secondly, what are the commandments that should be followed? What are the things in here? Not just what are the commandments. What are the commandments that I should follow? This is the application side. This is the the practicing. We need to practice the word of God. Don't just be hearers, but be hearers and doers. I want to give you four quick things in a conclusion. And maybe this is a, a time that we can talk about these things. First of all, I'll say it again, we need to slow down when we read our Bible. This is not a race. This, this, is, this, is, this is not a race, it's not a game. We're not doing this for fun. We're doing this to survive. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Don't, don't just skip the words. This isn't a time for speed reading or for uh, scanning. This is a time. Now, there is a time and a place for scanning. When I'm looking for a verse, I'm scanning the page, I'm looking. But when it comes to the devotional method of Bible study, slow down. It's not a race. You know, we, we think, oh, well, we have to read a chapter. Well, the list, the list says that I have to read uh, two, two chapters in the Old Testament and, and one in the New to get through 365 days, or you get the Bible done in 365 days. And I just got to hurry through this. I've only got 15 minutes. Well, guess what? Use your what time wisely. We want to get through the content of the Scripture. I know Rebecca's on a really aggressive plan. I don't think she's, you know, speed reading it. I know, Joel, you're on a, you're on a path to try to read through a lot of chapters, but you're also allocating a lot of time. And then there's a time and a place when you're talking devotional. You're talking a whole different level of of study. You're talking a different level, which we'll get to another date. But when it comes to the devotional method, slow down. How many times have you read a, a, a passage in Scripture and then not know what it was you read? How many times have you read through? Now, this will get you. You're going to love this. How many times have you read through a, a page or whatever, you pick up your Bible the next day, and you reread the page, and you realize about halfway through, I read this yesterday. Do you know why that happens? A lot of times I'll just tell you, because we read too fast. We read it without thought. Matter of fact, I just did that the other day. Literally, like like last week, I was reading, and I was reading, and I was reading, and I, I'm drinking my coffee, and I got to a verse that I was meditating on, and I thought, oh, I just read this yesterday. (laughs) Did I miss the whole 25 verses prior to this? We do that. Do you guys do that, or am I the only one? Raise your hand if you've done that. I don't look like an idiot, okay? It's a horrible thing, but you know what? It's we read it too fast. I would rather, I would rather slow it down and get through less content and have it mean more than to read through more content and have it mean less. We just read too fast. We read way too fast. we got to slow it down. We have to have time to process this. Hanging on every word, right? We need to be thinking about this in the context of, God has said something to me. I want to listen carefully. I don't know how many, someone comes up to you and says, hey, listen, I want to transfer a million dollars into your account, and he's not some Saudi Arabian prince. He's a legitimate guy who has a stack of money, and he says, I want to transfer all this into your account, and I'm going to give you the account number. Are you ready? I guarantee you, you're going to be like, time out. Let me get a pen, or let me record this conversation. I want to listen very, very carefully. Did you say that was a four or or, or 
or, or, or a five. I need to make sure this is right. You're listening with, with very acute detail. You're thinking about what it is God is saying. You're not just trying to breeze through it. We need to slow down. So these are the four things. Number one, make it personal. Make it personal. This is the conclusion to the application, okay? Make it personal. This has to do something with, with how what you can learn. How can you grow? This isn't dealing with your neighbor. We've all done that before. We've all heard a, we've all heard a message where you say, I wish so-and-so was here. We've all read a text that says, man, I, sh- I wish I had this yesterday because I talked to brother so-and-so, and, and man, if I would have had this, I could have really shown him how to live a good life. Make this thing personal to you. This has got to be about you. This is the time when God is speaking to you. When I'm studying to preach, God speaks to me, but my priority is what is God saying to me that I can tell others, right? That's, that's the method there. It's a different method. When I'm sitting down on my bed and I'm reading, I'm asking, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. So make it personal. Number two. Number two, make it practical. Make it practical. L- l- this is important. You know, if, if, if we want God to speak important things into our life, right? So when we're, when we're reading a text, this has got to be, this is important stuff. I, I, I'll never get over the fact that this is how God talks to us. This is how it works. He uses his word. That seems so foreign. I can't help but to think of somebody who maybe writes a letter to their loved one prior to them dying. Guy gets out a pen and (laughs) says all these really nice things to his wife and to his kids and to his uh, friends and the rest of his family. And that thing is photocopied and circulated at the funeral. And people begin to cry. They begin to begin to cry and mourn because that this letter is that person talking to them. I'll never get over the fact that this is this is God talking to us. And we, lit- we should be hanging on every word. This isn't a race. We're not trying to figure out who can get through it the fastest. I- I've heard people say, I- I've read the Bible hundreds and hundreds of times. Well, that's good. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm still amazed that, that a young kid who, who is sold out for God, who reads the Bible once and can apply it to his whole life. He'll spend, he'll, spend, he'll spend the rest of his life just continuing to read and apply and read and apply and read and apply because it's not academic for him. This is his heavenly father talking to him. This is real. It's not a race, right? So make it practical. This is important stuff. Number three, make it possible. Make it possible. The things that you're applying, make it possible. If it, in fact, is um, possible, okay, it... it, it don't don't try the impossible things. For instance, there's some impossible things. I'll give you one of them in James 3. We're in James tonight, so might as well just say James 3. But the tongue can no man tame. That's not possible. The Bible said it's not possible. Now, we can improve, or else there wouldn't be all of this, this exhortation to improve. But it's impossible to tame the tongue so why are you trying to be perfect in that sense? You'll never get there till you, till you die anyway. I think we can do a lot better. But even, even a Christian who's been a Christian for 60 years and has, you think D.L. Moody struggled with his tongue. Charles Spurgeon struggled with his tongue. Billy Sunday, God knows, he struggled with his tongue. Every, every mature Christian will continue to struggle with their tongue. 
Make it possible. Make it possible. As you're applying these things, make it personal, practical, and possible. And then thirdly, or fourthly and lastly, make it uh, uh, provable. Make it provable. You should have some, some means of measuring the fact that you're, in, you're, you're getting better. As we apply the scripture, we need, we need to know that we're, that there's, that we're uh, going forward. So make it provable. There should be some means of measurement. Make it personal, practical, possible, and provable. I, I, I totally stole those from someone else. I'll give you that. That's my confession to you. Uh, the rest of the message is mine. Those four are someone else's. If I told you, you'd think I'm apostate. So. <laughs> but they're very good, though, aren't they? They're very good. We need to start with, uh, start with praying. Every Christian should start with praying. If you don't start with praying you're going to lose a lot of traction in your devotional method of Bible study. Then partake the Word of God, begin to ponder it, and then practice that. You only get one crack at this in the morning. And, and, and there, are, there, are, there are days, like Saturdays maybe, where you can consistently think about what it was you read in the morning. But I would venture to guess that if, if I was to ask 100 Christians, after having some level of intense time with God in the morning. If I was to ask them, tell me a little bit about your quiet time this morning. Where did you read? What did it mean to you? What was a verse that stuck out most to you? Most of those hundred people would say, I don't know, because here's what happens. We get flooded with all the demands of this world. We just get so busy. We get into this. We get into that. We get into this. And what's the next meeting? And where do I got to be next? And how do I get there? And why isn't my car working? And why doesn't the window roll up? You know, what is wrong? Like, I just can't seem to figure this thing out. I mean, it just goes from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, right? And so that time in the morning has got to be like the most important time that you allocate for God because without that time, your day is just gone. And even then you might have that time in the morning and still forget about it throughout the day. That's how important it was. It was that meeting in the morning that makes, makes the, the rest of the day just so much better. As we begin to study the different methods, you will find that this, that what these principles that we're talking about here will be woven through all of what we're, what we're talking about. When you talk about geography and chronology, all of these different ways of studying your Bible, this will be sown through all of that. And it's wonderful. But this is the most important part because this is where you grow spiritually. This is spiritual growth. You will grow intellectually, but this is the spiritual growth. People can grow intellectually and not know anything about a relationship with God. They can grow intellectually and not have and not have and have a very shallow shallow relationship. This is where you grow spiritually. This is where God comes alive to you. This is where you have a relationship with your heavenly Father, an intimate one where you know God, not just know about him, but you know him and you love him and you know that he loves you and you walk with God and talk with God, this is where that happens right here, this devotion, this quiet time in the morning.